Dear friends, we are gathered here on the 10th anniversary of uh, 9-11 uh, to heal and to be healed. And this is a sacred moment for all of us as we remember the deep wound that we suffered on 9-11 in 2001 and how that memory changed the world forever. Uh, at a deeper level, we are here to atone and to become one in spirit so that uh, we can not only repair this deep wound in our collective psyche, this deep wound in our collective soul, but also, also to see how we can move beyond that. I think um, thanks to the work of many luminaries in the world of uh, spirituality and my friend James O'Day, uh, to those of you who are gathered here, it's very obvious that the world is a projection of our collective consciousness and that our minds are entangled. Right now our minds are entangled. They're regulating the flow of energy in our brains, in our bodies, and because we relate to other people, they're regulating the flow of energy and information in the whole cosmos. And uh, the planet is wounded because we have come from a divided mind. The great spiritual traditions of the world have said uh, that there is no way to heal the world as long as the mind is divided. The great spiritual traditions have also showed us methods and means to go beyond the divided mind to that state of unity consciousness where we see ourselves as the evolutionary impulse of the universe and where we are the embodiment of love so that it becomes impossible to hurt or be hurt. In my tradition, Vedanta, um, reality is different in different states of consciousness. And that is because perception is different in state, different states of consciousness. Uh, cognition or knowing is different in different states of consciousness. Feelings, moods, emotions are different. Therefore, personal relationships and social interactions are different. Therefore, society is different. Therefore, ultimately, civilization is different. Therefore, environments that we create are different. And the way we interact with the forces of nature, which are in harmony most of the time, our interaction with the forces of nature is also different. If we change our state of consciousness, we change reality. Reality is the projection of our state of consciousness. Most of us, thanks to the hypnosis of social conditioning, assume that our mind is our own, that it belongs only to us when in fact our minds are entangled. Right now my mind is entangled with yours, yours with mine. And through our relationships and social interactions and now social media, our minds are entangled across the globe. In one way it's really good because we are moving slowly but surely out of our limited identities, whether they are religious or ethnic or national or tribal, uh, we are slowly moving to a more global identity. And my hope ultimately is to a universal identity, because that is our real identity. Any label we give ourselves, any um, way we judge ourselves or qualify ourselves, limits our unbounded universal self the one that the great rishis call Aham Brahmasmi, I am the universe. And in my tradition, there are many levels of experience of consciousness. Um, we go through waking and dreaming and sleeping, but there's a fourth state of consciousness called Thurya, where you become aware of the witnessing awareness within you. Right now, as you're listening to me and you're watching me, just turn your attention to the one who's listening, to the one who's watching. Do it right now. That present, that presence that you feel, the ever witnessing awareness, is um, your observer, your observing self, your witnessing self, 
if you want. It's your soul, which is transcendent. And so, you know, beyond waking and dreaming and sleeping consciousness, there is the soul consciousness or transcendent consciousness. In my tradition, we call it Thurya, the fourth state of consciousness. As you abide in that witnessing awareness, and it slowly creeps into your waking, dreaming and sleeping consciousness, you move to cosmic consciousness, where the ever-present witnessing awareness is fully awake, whether you're in waking state or sleeping state or dreaming state. And in that ever-wakefulness, you see yourself as spirit, the observer of both mind and body. In a sense, you're local and non-local at the same time. You're in this world and not of it at the same time. And as you experience this sense of deeper consciousness, which is inseparable from all that exists, you have more peace, you have more joy, you have more equanimity, you have less judgment, you have more love, you have more compassion. You yearn for more truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, and to be in alignment with the evolutionary impulse of the cosmos. But even cosmic consciousness is not um, the end of our evolution because as we become aware of the witnessing awareness within us, it soon becomes possible to perceive or cognize or be aware of the witnessing awareness in others. So when I can see a spirit <clears throat> all the time, when I can know it, I can feel it, I can commune with it, and not only just yours but with the spirit that exists everywhere, then that is a state of consciousness which can only be called divine consciousness because now the divine is not difficult to find but impossible to avoid. Wherever you go, you see that the divine is never overshadowed by the object of your perception. This is the realm of real communion, of unbounded, unconditional love, because spirit communes with spirit beyond all the labels, all the evaluations, all the definitions, all the judgments. And this is a state of healing as well because there's a sense of wholeness to the experience. As I said, God is not difficult to avoid. God is impossible. God is not difficult to find. God is impossible to avoid. And because spirit communes with spirit, this is also the realm of miracles. And finally, there's unity consciousness, which is even beyond uh, cosmic consciousness, where all these witnessing awarenesses merge into one ocean of awareness, and we see the whole universe as a projection of that awareness. And that's also called enli enlightenment or freedom from all conditioning. As we move into these deeper levels of awareness, love uh, assumes a larger dimension. The great uh, Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet and Rishi and seer said, love is not a mere sentiment. Love is the ultimate truth. Love is the ultimate truth at the heart of creation, that a single consciousness has differentiated through all of us into different observers different modes of perception and different uh, objects of perception. Each of us is the universal being located as a point of view, seeing ourselves as that point of view. In fact, through us, the universe finds an opportunity to look at itself in an infinity of modes of perception. This is the miracle of creation and this is also the miracle of consciousness that as we move beyond ego consciousness to soul consciousness to cosmic consciousness to divine consciousness to unity consciousness, everything that we call reality shifts when ultimately you become a being in love, being in love. Light radiates from you like a bonfire. But this is the light of love. The light of love radiates from you like a bonfire. It is not necessarily focused on anyone, but it is not denied to anyone either. And in that light of love, 
there is wholeness, there is healing, we are holy and we are healed. And that is the direction we all are aspiring to, that we have the yearning for, that is our deep spiritual yearning, that place that Rumi says is out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, the field where we must meet in order to heal our wounds. So I would like to offer that we do that together, that we have the intention to wake up every day for both personal and social transformation, that we wake up every day with three questions. How can I make my life more meaningful? How can I make my life more fulfilled? How can I make my life more joyful? And how can I radiate that meaning, that fulfillment, that joy to the ocean of consciousness which has within it all all observers, all modes of observation and all objects. Because if I can do that and I can participate in creating a critical mass of that consciousness, then I can also participate in my own healing, but in the healing of others. Just a short personal story. On 9-11, on the day this accident happened, the great tragedy of our planet, Um, I say an accident because unconsciously is when all accidents happen, lack of awareness. And in that sense, it was part of our collective sleep of the divided mind that led to this. I was on a plane from New York. I was grounded in Detroit. My son was on another plane to uh, Los Angeles. My wife was on another plane. We were all coming to New York or leaving from New York. And for eight hours, I didn't know if my loved ones were safe or not. My body was a wreck, as if I had been hit by a truck and unable to get up. Eight hours later, I found out that my wife and my son were safe, and suddenly everything felt good, till the thought came that so many people in the world are feeling what I'm feeling because of 9-11. But so many people have felt like this because of the wars in the world, the wars between the Arabs and the Israelis, the wars between the Protestants and the um, uh, Catholics, the wars between the Albanians and the Serbs, the wars between the Hindus and the Jews. And yet our identity beyond that is much more universal. And I asked myself, why don't I feel that pain? Why don't I feel that anguish? And I resolved there and then to feel the suffering of the world and in that suffering to be bewildered by the experience of a suffering that we can only cause compassion, a shared suffering in which love is born and in that love in which healing is born. So I've dedicated my life to that field of collective suffering, empathy, compassion, love, to find my own inner peace. And that for me is, I hate to use the word a gift, but that's the gift that was born in this tragedy for me. The dedication to live my life non-violently, and to be the embodiment of love, compassion, joy, equanimity, and creativity. I would like to end this message with two prayers that I wrote on that day, uh, which ended up being part of uh, my book, The Deeper Wound. The first is, I will pray to forgive. God in spirit, I am hard of heart today. There is someone I cannot forgive. My own hurt blocks the way. I feel the sting of being wronged. Take the stiffness from my heart. Let me feel the joy of tenderness. Restore peace and lift the energy of grievance. Let me truly forgive as I would be forgiven. So I offer this prayer to you. It is about asking to feel more than you feel. 
And the second prayer is my prayer of love, which I also wrote on 9-11-2001. God in spirit, show your love through me. This is all I want or have ever wanted. Make a secret pact with me. Let someone in my life feel your touch as I feel it myself. Intimate, tender, joyful and healing. When this happens, don't let them see me, but only you. No one needs to know that I am in you and you in me. We'll keep our secret until eternity. I made those two packs for love and forgiveness. And you have given me the opportunity to reinforce those commitments. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to move in the direction of healing the divided mind. And then loud, loud, let's do it together with all in our power, through our personal relationships, through our social interactions, through our social networks. And let's move towards that critical mass where we, we can all project a different kind of world. A world that is peaceful, sustainable, just, healthy, happy and loving. Thank you.